us as females, sometimes we gotta let each other know how to treat a man and how to keep a man. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the House of Karma. I'm your host, Carmen Serrano, and I'm here with the lovely Sonia Colon. Welcome. She oh. is the CEO and um, of Survivor I Am, founder of Survivor I Am, mm -hmm. which is um, for domestic violence victims. It's actually, um, so it's a nonprofit bringing awareness to adverse childhood experiences. So it like encompasses an umbrella of so much uh, oh, childhood yeah. trauma, basically. So not just domestic violence, but um, emotional, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse being the number one, one in four girls, one in six boys. I have to say that because it's always the most it's prevalent. It's like the most common. Um, it's the most the common. numbers keep on just rising in yeah. the United States alone. And it's crazy because it, I don't understand how so many you know children women children you know so much abuse is going on in this country with dcf and everything involved like how is it that it's still happening you know what i mean well unfortunately there's a lot of shame and secrecy when it comes to you know child sexual abuse like a child gets abused they don't even realize that they're being abused because they're too young to even process that they're Absolutely. being abused. So then by the time that they are an awakened self, so to speak, where they reach that pivotal point in their life where they can comprehend, mm -hmm. that's when they feel shamed and, you know, they hide in secrecy because, right. you know, 93% of the abusers are like literally people that we know, and love trust. and trust. Absolutely. You know, so you're talking about, unfortunately, you are talking about factually, this is proven to be, you know, mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers right. and kissing cousins and, you know, which is crazy because, you know, I, I think that um, a lot of people also have shame because sometimes, unfortunately, they still go on to later in life have some type of relationship with that person. Right. Maybe not like, hey, we're buddies. But you see them at your you see family. Them, you interact with them. Yeah, you have to be yeah. around them. So what inspired you to to start this foundation? Uh, so I want to say about, I mean, honestly, about four to four and a half years ago, I was sitting in the living room. This is when I was watching a lot of television, which was one of my many addictions. Um, and they were playing the news. And the news just kept showing just so much trouble and and you know like a man kills his wife and somebody mentally unstable you know goes crazy and you know a ch child is you know in the streets and they're homeless and all of these stories that to me i felt that even though they were different they still had something in common which was you know those are traumatized individuals like you know someone doesn't you know i always say to people you know a child doesn't say hey i want to be a killer when i grow up right. i want to be opioid addict when I grow up. I want to be a prostitute when I grow up. I want to be homeless when I grow right. up. Nobody has those dreams or those visions for themselves. Right. You know, so a lot of times when you look back at these individuals that are manifesting, you know, ill and maladaptive behavior and bad coping mechanisms, got to run it back to childhood, you know, Absolutely. and and it was either something that was a missing component that they didn't receive or something that they did receive that was really highly traumatizing to them to process. Right. And sometimes it could be like a generational curse that goes on from generation to it generation is. to generation. And um, the important thing is to know when to, s you know, say, I'm going to be the one who's going to break the generational curse in my family. And I think that's where your foundation um, comes to play. And it, it helps a lot of, like you said, I want to say broken people because we're living in a society that there's so many broken people out there and it's not just mental illness it's it's mental illness it's depression it's just so much drug addiction so much factors people take drugs to hide pain you know what i mean or absolutely so there's a doctor that i really follow closely i love all his work gabor mate you could look him up he's just amazing and he um, worked, you know, in Canada, downtown with like opioid crisis, which is crazy there as it is everywhere. Yeah. It's not just there, it's everywhere. Right now it can't be ignored. Right. Like before, it was like, oh, 
it's only them. No, now it's like only everywhere, like your Absolutely. backyard, your home. You probably know someone, you know, that is telling you, man, you know, I had to go get, you know, that refill, you know, because mm -hmm. my leg been acting up. You know what I mean? But yeah. meanwhile, they don't even realize that they're starting to actually grow into an addiction. addiction you know, so so it's it's just rampant everywhere. And I'm just trying to bring an awareness in that, you know, we're not alone. Any trauma that we've ever go gone through, I think that's one of the things that people feel is that they're alone in that circumstance. You know, and I feel like when you at least open up the dialogue and open up the conversation, then you might have that word that somebody needed. Absolutely. You know, and then once it's been heard by them, they're like, wait a minute, you didn't, you know, you didn't go through that. Right. Yeah, Some I people are stronger that. than others. That's that's definitely, you know, a factor. You you know, so one one of the things I want to tell you, be only because you said some people are stronger than others. So you could have two individuals that are growing up in the same household, right? Yeah. Same trauma. They're experiencing the same trauma. One goes resilient, right? They do fine. You know, they're mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, they're overachievers, mm -hmm. right? And then the other one is, you know, a product of, you know, opioid or the homeless epidemic or, you know, prostitution, whatever it is, whatever Absolutely. maladaptive cope that they've done. You know, and then sometimes, sadly, the one that, you know, is fine doesn't understand that one. So here's that person that actually needs empathy mm -hmm. from that person that actually experienced the same thing. But they feel instead, I don't understand what's their problem. I mean, I got over it. It's not about getting over it. It's about helping one another to move through it. It's about Absolutely. saying, okay, you know what? That was then, but you are here now. And bringing a person back into their present moment is basically trying to help people through their anxiety moments, right? Right, right. Because what do you feel when you feel that trigger of whatever trauma you've gone through? And I don't even know. I, I'm just assuming. I'm assuming that we're all survivors of something. Absolutely. So I apologize for that. But honestly, statistics, whether I go to domestic violence, and it's so funny that you say that because a lot of people think that my organization is domestic violence. And I actually can say I've never experienced domestic violence firsthand at all. You know, however, I am a survivor of child sexual abuse, you know, mm -hmm. and I can say that, you know, even at the age of 48, it's still not something, you don't get over it. You move Absolutely. through those emotions. You move and you learn how to process you know, those emotions, and also how to be okay with that. You're not going to feel okay every day. And right. that if you turn on the news and you hear the news about, you know, something that just happened, it might just trigger you, you know. So you have to have those deep breath moments, you know, or have, you know, your daughter or someone that you can call. So in other words, Absolutely. what I'd like to bring to the community is how do we build our toolbox? What's in our toolbox? Right. So when you open up Pandora's box and start dealing with all those deeply rooted, unaddressed toxic stress, because mm -hmm. it is toxic, it is scientifically proven that it releases and it dysregulates your uh, uh, your stress response system. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is that your fight or flight response, it doesn't know when to stop because you're so hypersensitive. Right. So when you have, you know, ADHD you know, and all these mental illnesses, mm -hmm. just trace it back to your childhood. Trace it back to anybody's childhood, you know. Right. Really, really look at your childhood. Look at your environment. Look at your, not just genetics, but epigenetics, which means everything on top of genetics, which, again, transfers into your environment, your experiences, you know, um, your relationships, your lack of relationships. Right. How healthy are your relationships? Absolutely. Do you have any relationships? So those two children that grew up in the same household, one of them had a teacher that spoke life onto them. Mm -hmm. But the other one didn't have that in his toolbox. Mm -hmm. And how does a child develop a toolbox in the first place? They're children. You know, Absolutely. Um, one of the doctors also that I, you know, pay close attention to, he said, you know, as children, we are born narcissistic. Think about it. Everything is about us. When we're born, when, mm -hmm. we, when we're hungry, we cry. When we poop, we cry, yeah, help right, me, help right. me, help me. Now, what is the reaction to that? Is it a mother, a loving mother, or is it a mother in distress? Like, oh, my God, I can't get the baby to stop crying because, you know, the baby's colic. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't my daughter was college. You know, that was a really hard time for me. And I had to call on family members, like, what do I do? You know, and they're like, oh, you know, take her legs and, you know, rotate up the belly and, you know, massage and do what you can. But what if you don't have someone to tell you that? And then all you're doing is continually building this, you know, release of cortisol and, you know, that stress mm. response system is dysregulated. That's when you have like those freak cases where the lady's like, I don't, I couldn't take it. I couldn't take it. And she wouldn't stop crying. Mm. That's very interesting that you, that you mentioned that because I want to say maybe like three years ago, um, they, there was a lady who actually lived like, I didn't know her personally, but she lived like maybe like a street, a block away. Mm-hmm. And it was reported that she threw her six month old baby out of the window and she was like preparing, I guess, to, to throw her other kids out the window. And and I always thought like, what would make a mother like snap like that? Like, like that's a baby, you know, like you push the baby out. Or even like the mothers that have kids and then they don't want them. Like they neglect them, they don't, you know, they just give them up to the, the, their mothers or the, their, the baby fathers or something. And so sometimes I sit and I think, like, what would make a person not care about a child that they carried for so long? You know what I mean? And so, I mean, it's good that you point that out because you kind of opened up my mind, my understanding a little bit. Um, how long have you been having this organization? Uh, I am officially a 501c3. Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> that, that's what's happening. I was yeah. like, why does this feel like... It looks like, like a headband and then it starts yes, going down like know, glasses. I like, this is kind of uncomfortable. You just got to move your mic down a oh little. My God. <laughs> it's okay. Hello. We're live. We are live. <laughs> and this is what happens live, right? You got to go with the flow, you know? That's right. Um, so the nonprofit, again, so the idea was four years ago, right? Um, then I became unemployed, like, almost three years to the date and I had worked there for almost 20 years that's like kind of unheard of right I worked there I was very complacent I will say that that's definitely one of the ramifications of like childhood trauma that you internalize first of all you compartmentalize a lot of the things that you did go through so you're not even in the process of processing your emotions because you don't know how to process your emotions You know, and then when you um, get older, you know, in adolescence, then you start having insecurity issues, you know, you start having self-esteem issues, you know. So I feel like the way it ultimately played out in my life is that I was complacent. I was very comfortable where I worked for 20 years. Now, am I saying that, hey, guys, if you've been working there for 20 years, you should go put your resume out there somewhere else. No, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, you know, where you are, that's fine. I'm just saying for myself, I know that it was a part of me allowing myself to be complacent because I had, you know, all these insecurities, you know, about like, you know, I I say I suffer from that. Who am I to be so great complex? You know, Mm -hmm. like you ever had that um, feeling you wake up and you're having a good day. And, you know, I know that you're a singer, right? Singer, rapper, artist. All right, (laughs) singer. You have these days where you're in the flow and you're like, man, I'm born for this. Good, yeah. yeah, I'm born for this. I'm built <laughs> for this. You know, there's nobody like me. And, and you're absolutely right in that thought process. There is absolutely nobody like you. There is no replication of your DNA anywhere in the world. You know, you are unique and individual in that way. And I like to say we are our own worst enemies. Absolutely. You absolutely. Know, we're our, our worst critics. Because somebody else would tell me, wow, that song sounded good. And I'm like, really? I don't like it. I think I got to re-record it. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But it could stem with the childhood trauma, like you said, because I've been an orphan since I was about eight years old. Um, so growing up, you know, I was always moving around a lot, and I was always a new girl. And so it was it, it was always kind of, like, rough because it was hard for me to make friends because I would make friends with somebody, and then... And you're tough. I'd have I know to you're move tough. somewhere else. I know you're a tough... I know you're a tough <laughs> cookie because we're friends on Facebook, you know, and I know that oh, you're I tough. See. And it's crazy. No, <laughs> Mo, but but here's the thing. Like, your experiences shaped you, you know. I mean, you had to be tough. I, you had seeing, to be strong. I grew up seeing my older sister. She's she's like five feet tall, but her attitude is like 6'3". And this girl, like, she will fight anybody. Like, she was like, 
like I always looked up to her like wow she's just real like strong like she don't take no crap from wow. nobody yeah, you yeah. know so I gotta kind of be like her because like if I'm a little weakling like my family is the type of family that they will get on you like they, they'll start making fun of you not in a bad way yeah. but it's always like if you don't have a, a comeback I'm always the one that don't have a comeback I'm like oh, whatever just bring just give it to me like, oh. <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> But um yeah like sometimes you know I f I do feel like I have to have my guard up and I have to be you know tough because um just being picked on being bullied in school always being the new girl that's a trauma you know? by the way you know like okay Absolutely. so so adversities you know physical emotional sexual um household dysfunction so you know a person in the household substance abuse mm -hmm. you know drug abuse uh alcohol abuse uh a parent with mental, that suffers from mental illness, which a good majority of the yeah. population, you know, even your best friends, even your mama, your papa, even yourself, you know, we all have a little bit of mental illness to a certain degree. I'm not saying that we're all, oh my God, we're all crazy. That's not right. what I'm saying. And that's not really what mental Ooh. illness is. You know, I mean, there's depression, but think about the world that we live in and the complexities of the world, you know, and, and again, everything goes back to childhood abandonment issues mm -hmm. that's a big one that's also an adversity you yes. know there were these 10 key um you know adverse and one of them is abandonment like so you're you know in a foster care system that gives you abandonment issues you know your your father left the household what do we do as children why did daddy leave it's my fault you right. know or or the mother leave you feel the same way and you know how does it play out? Rage. Rage is a big deal. You know, mm -hmm. some people get introverted and shy, right? And then sometimes you have those people that they're really nice. They're really, really nice. They're always nice. They're people pleasers. They mm -hmm. give, they give, they give. Yeah, because that's me. <laughs> right. I, I, you gotta, be, you gotta be careful. I used to be a people pleaser, not no more. As I got older, I started realizing like, no. You gotta, you know, give, but don't, don't be dumb and let you know what I mean? People take advantage of you and walk all over you. But um, is, do we got to go to commercial break? All right. We're going to continue with this conversation right after this. Um, with Ms. Sonia Cologne, <laughs> CEO and founder of <laughs> I Am. Survivor I Am. Survivor. <laughs> Survivor I Am. I apologize. It's all good. Survivor I Am. <laughs>
Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the House of Karma. I'm your host, Karma Serrano, and I'm here with the founder and CEO of Survivor I Am, Ms. Sonia Colon. Hi. And we are talking about different type of um, adversaries that we go through growing up and things that we see and um, basically explain your foundation to the viewers that are just tuning in again, please. Sure. So... Survivor I Am is seeking to spread among the community, so I'm starting in my own community, very grassroots movement, um, 10461 Throsneck area, but you know, obviously I hope to branch out because the awareness needs to be there on adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. They're basically, you know, uh, traumatic experiences that we endure, witness, and go through as children, and we compartmentalize it for a long time because that's what we do as children. So if you think about physical abuse, emotional abuse, emotional, physical neglect. So it could be that you just grew up in a very poor family and you just really didn't know when your next meal was going to come to you, you know, and you didn't know when you were going to be fed or you didn't know when your dad was going to be in a good mood. You didn't know if you were going to catch rage dad or nice dad that was going to buy you a happy meal. Like those are traumatic experiences that we endure as children and um, compartmentalize them again but then they start to seep and creep in the decisions that we make and you know the lifestyles that we live and as a matter of fact uh, you know it's the number one public health concern throughout the world that is like the least still to this day properly addressed and the reason why I say that is because there is science-based um, you know, uh, case studies that have shown that toxic childhood stress leads and lends itself to manifest later on in your life in many chronic illnesses. What's the uh, mm -hmm. the lung one? C C P C O P D. I I forget the the lung disease. Chronic. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. C O P D. Yes. It's so sad because, you know, I have a brother that, you know, suffers from that. And, and I know for a fact because we've had conversations that, you know, he had a lot of traumatic experiences. I mean, first of all, his dad is my dad, but my dad, you know, I'm th we have different mothers. Mm. So he would come on the weekends. Right. And he would be a part of our family. But how do you think that it probably made him feel as a child? Again, not mm. saying my dad didn't love him, but I'm talking about a child's perspective. Right. So, and my perspective is, you know, because we were all once children, this should resonate with every single person. Absolutely. Because if you think about your own childhood, you will think about the need that you felt that you didn't receive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, look, our parents did the best that they can based on the best that they had. But sometimes right. the best that they had was nothing at all. So, right. you know, it goes back to like, do you have a toolbox? You know, so I'm trying to bring awareness to the community in how at least talking about this toxic stress that we endure, you know, as children, right. you know, you can get back to in, in other words, the brain is malleable. So we can reprogram and retrain our brain to be more resilient. So when you get to like a trigger, your first response is not to just panic, you know, right. Because that panic and that dysregulation in your heartbeat mm -hmm. is also going to release an a entourage of, of cortisol in, in, your, you know, in your immune system. And that's right. going to weaken your defenses. You now, know? do you have um, a childhood trauma that you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Yeah, sure. Because I'm pretty sure somebody out there that's watching can probably relate and, you know, are gathering information that they... The, uh, this is wonderful information because even stuff that I wasn't aware of, I'm like looking, thinking, um, listening to you and thinking, wow, that sounds familiar. Like I'm, I'm experiencing that or I've experienced that. Yeah, um, that feeling. That feeling. Yes. Um, well, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you know, I had a cousin, and you know, was me. Uh, she's really close. So cousin, <laughs> she's really close to my mom. Um, so you know, they would speak. You know, I, I remember and I don't have uh, long uh, memories so it, which is very typical of traumatized you know individuals where they don't have like moment for moment recall but they know that they experienced and went through something um, 
but they would speak like pig latin is that what you call it like chitu chimi chiti yeah you know? we used to do that me and my yeah. sister used to so do that, that i wouldn't understand <laughs> what they were saying so um in in retrospect now thinking about it that's probably why i never told my mother you know that i was being abused um for whatever reason they were really really close you know so if they were close enough to speak pig latin then you know obviously who was i to say hey you know this is what's happening mm -hmm. and also at the time that i was being abused you know um i was really young so i would say it started between the age of five and six so you don't really you don't really know much at five and six years old you know now, when you talk about abuse are you talking about like physical abuse? sexually abused so i was sexually abused so i i don't By a female? I, yeah i don't recall that i did um anything and i don't even recall the like lengthy extents of visuals in other words and i thank god for that because i think if yeah. i have visuals, i think if i had a read the visuals and i think that believe it or not there's a, a part of the population that we will never know because they opted out of life and committed suicide i really do believe that for them you know those visuals are are daunting and haunting absolutely and they have to relive them and and you know it comes with a lot of shame and secrecy you know for me i'm a heterosexual woman you know but here i was at five years old i don't even know what sex is yet right. the act was being done to me you know right. so before i even knew what it was i had already experienced and this i say honestly because i do remember the sensation i remember the sensation of what an orgasm felt like and i was wow. five years old you know six years old, seven years old, you know and um how long did this abuse um, ha continue? Um, I feel like it went on to like about maybe, uh, I want to say fourth grade. Yeah, my son is 10, like about fourth fourth grade. And then, um, and it was only because I believe they moved away, you know, so I didn't have, they didn't have access to me anymore. See what I'm saying? Right. So the access changed. You know, but prior to that, they lived like so close to me, you know, so um, and it's crazy because, you know, I thought I was like fine. Like I thought I was over everything, you know, you just eh, I'm good, you know, and um, my paternal uh, grandmother died and I had to go to the wake and I had to see this person and I was already an adult grown woman and I was very cordial. You know, I'm a very, like, uh, I want to say, yeah, I guess that's a passive aggressive thing, right? To pretend like you're okay with something, but meanwhile, you're really not okay with it. But it wasn't the time nor place to address something that happened so long ago. And then I remember I went home and, and I bawled like a baby. Like, I bawled like a baby. Like, I was like, I can't believe, you know, that I had to face that person. And I couldn't say anything and I couldn't, you know, and, and I didn't even realize then that I felt anything like I, I just saw the person I thought nothing was felt of it and then when I got home it just hit me and I just started weeping all like the a memories baby. started coming back yeah and... yeah totally and you know what I think it did for me is you know then then here's the thing so when you become a person that is when you're sexually abused I feel like predators are like on high alert and they just they know that you're already a traumatized you know yeah. um sexually abused child because you're shy you're introverted you know whatever you're be or maybe you're the opposite maybe you're the type that you know easily sits on people's lap you know you're um how do they say you know kuleka i don't yeah i don't know how to say that in you know like very like flirtatious, flirtatious or right but loose. again you don't even you don't realize that you're doing bad behavior you don't realize that your behavior is inappropriate because you're a child you know, and so again, your experiences shape you, you know, and make you who you are. And then I had um, other experiences of people taking advantage of me. Um, and for me, it wasn't like, honestly, it wasn't like a big deal. It was like, okay, I'm being abused. You know, I don't like know. Like you got to, used to it. I don't know how to, you know, say it other than, yeah, I was used to the abuse. Like it was fine. It was no problem. And then something changed when I was uh, 12 years old, my dad. You know, my mom, they broke up and dad left. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Dad left and um, I, you know, mom thought she was doing a good thing and, and, 
you know, there was a cousin that came to live with us. And, you know, on a school day, um, I was on the couch and, you know, I was sleeping and I felt a heavy presence, you know, like on top of me. And I closed my eyes, like, even though I could have opened them. But I said, God, no, please, God, no, no, not again, not again. Like, no. And honestly, in my mind, I thought, okay, so I know what it's like to be, you know, abused by a woman. And actually, like I said, my body reacted and knowing what those sexual sensations are, which is crazy, right? Because I think that's part of the shame that people feel that, oh, my God, I had. I enjoyed it. I had I wasn't these supposed to. feelings, right. you know. I think Maya Angelou actually um, wrote a poem about her stepfather or something like that where she talks about that she actually, you know, didn't mind. And you're a child. You don't know. You love this person. You trust this person. You idol. You know, this is your family. You know, so it's some tough stuff. And then that was when I actually decided. So, so he took his hand and like put it up my shirt. And I thought to myself, if I don't say something now, I'm I'm about to be raped. You know, and I definitely didn't know what penetration was at 12. So I pushed them away. And I remember the telephone rang, and it kind of felt like saved by, the by god you know he didn't pursue it or anything went like nothing happened and i said i'm not keeping this in anymore you know and i told my mom because i had to because if i didn't then what would happen the next time right because right. you know he has access to me and then um you know sadly the matriarch of the family you know my grandmother she didn't believe because that's what people do they want to sweep it under the rug and that's when my whole life started to like really you know like and teenage I, drinking i think that um that happens a lot commonly in like the hispanic community um growing up and one of the places that i lived in was in dominican republic and over there i seen like little girls as young as i was i was like 12 13 years old and they were drinking alcohol like it was legal out there like they could drink alcohol they can go to clubs and i would see like these grown men with these little girls and they're holding hands and that's my that's my that's my man and they living together oh my god and to me i remember thinking mm. like this is not normal no um and so at first like i i actually experienced watching it from my own sister um in my head i thought you know what is she doing like why is she sitting on his lap like that's a you know that's a grown man and my family was so accepting of it like it was my brother's one of my older brother's um best friends and then my aunt she sent to get me and my younger brother and they left her there my sister was the type like you said uh very cool she used to like to wear makeup not her my other sister um she had she was very developed for a little girl and mm. so it was easily like she could pass like she was like 12 years old but she could pass for like a 15 16 wow. year old and so my family i guess in their mind they thought well that's how she came over here like acting like that so i guess it's okay so when my sister you know she came out pregnant at 13 and she had her baby like it didn't dawn to me that you know maybe she was maybe she was abused when she said you know he raped me like and in my head, I'm like, yeah, but I used to see her sitting on his lap and stuff like that. Like, Dito, but yeah, and she's you don't like, know. no, like he, like I hate him, like he raped me, like I, you know what I mean. And my family was like, well, that's your man now, you gotta go live with him. And my sister would tell me, you know, as we got older, she would tell me stories of like how he used to physically abuse her and beat her and all this stuff. And you know, it didn't dawn to me that maybe she was telling the truth. Maybe she really was being abused. You know, and and maybe, you know, because she, she had her son, she had a situation, she ended up coming back to the United States and leaving her son there. And then her son, he's still out there. He's already, like, a grown man, like, in his 20s. Um, but he felt like, you know, damn, my mom doesn't love me. She doesn't call me, doesn't say, look for me. I was going to say, I'm sorry, but that's trauma again. right there, too. Like, we don't even realize, like, look, racism, you know, that's trauma, okay? You right. know. To like I really feel I feel so bad right now because like talking to you like I'm I'm like wow like maybe you know maybe my sister was calling out for help and I didn't we we wasn't understanding because we're 
we're looking at things like, well, look at how she's acting. You know what I mean? Like maybe, you know, and then it, it I think about like, you know, that's probably how, how rape victims feel when people say, well, she was asking for it. She was drinking. She was, right. she was doing this. She was doing exactly. that. So like, I, I really do want to apologize to my sister because maybe like I should have been more understanding but you know what there's still time you know and that's what you know like building relationships you know there's always time to repair relationships you know and for me like i know that sounds crazy but um because a lot of people don't you know they won't agree with this and it depends on the severity of what people have gone through to be quite honest like you know i can't speak for anybody else's experience you know but my own but i have for me not that I want to hang out with them, not that I want to, you know, go have coffee or anything like that, but I forgive them because for me, it's part of my moving on, you know, it's part of me not staying in that moment. It's part of me empowering myself to know that I'm not a woman and I'm not that little girl anymore, yeah. right? That was the little girl, you know, and now, so I've mourned for her, you know, and I'm okay, you know, and, and, and there's a reason, I know it sounds crazy, but there's a reason for everything, right? I hadn't gone through that, then or anything that I've gone through, then I wouldn't have the, the purpose that I have right now. You know, maybe, maybe somebody else, you know, I'm breaking cycles within my own family and just speaking about it. You know, the relationships in my family have, the dynamics have changed immensely in just talking about adversity, you know? Sorry about that. No, that's okay. You know, in just talking about adversity. And again, adversity is many things. Again, if a parent is taken out of the family, unit because he's incarcerated that's an adversity Absolutely. you know racism is an adversity you know if you live in poverty an underdeveloped country that's an adversity if you've been displaced it, the immigration yeah that's the children being stripped away did you know there was a there was actually that um thousands of children went missing right no thousands of of children have been sexually abused by those that are supposed to be protecting them while they're in okay. detainment Jesus. and away from their family. Thousands. You can look it up. I'm, this is fact. You know. I believe it. And, and you know, it's like, so so when are we going to realize that children are the most vulnerable population in the world? Absolutely. We were once children. We don't. What, is that so hard to swallow? Like, is it so hard to fathom? If you were a child yourself. Is it really that hard to fathom that, you know, think about how sensitive we are when we're growing up. Absolutely. And what it takes, you know, a baby cannot, you know, just a human being cannot survive without, you know, connectedness, without relationship building, right? It has to be fed by someone. It has to be cared for by someone. So it's the same thing throughout society. Like, what are we doing? Where, where is our compassion? You know, everybody wants to, you know, it's easy to say, like, you know, Mr. Rogers had said, you know, like it's easy to say, you know, um, it's not my problem. It's not my child. It's not my issue, you know, until it is. Absolutely. So, you know, when do we pay attention? We pay attention when it's come up into our own household. We should be taking a proactive and preventative stance against adversity. Right. Now, what can we do um, if if. Any anybody knows somebody who's going through some type of trauma or physical, sexual, mental, emotional abuse? Like, how can we help somebody? Because sometimes I see on Facebook, um, a lot of people they cry for help. Like, and then some people say, "Oh, you're just crying. You're just doing that for attention." But sometimes people like really, really are going through something, and they just want to put it down on Facebook because they feel like they don't have anybody else to talk to. Yeah, you know what's crazy is I actually have a resource sheet, but um, I mean, there's definitely organizations that you can, you know, partner up with. I know um, Safe Horizon is doing great things, and I know that they have like a hotline that you can call. You know, there's a lot of organizations that are doing the work. I'm certainly not the first, nor will I be the last. You know, um, through Survivor I Am, what I am looking to do is try to pull those resources and have them under one tenant so that people could, you know, one umbrella, one space, so that people right. can look for it, you know. But there's organizations that are really deep in it. Um, there's Prevent Abuse New York, you know, that's specifically for that. And I know there's a lot of um, domestic violence, you know, hotlines and stuff like that. But I would say to people, you know, speak, speak your truth, you know. It really, you know, the truth sets you free. It just actually is freeing is what right. it does. It's like that which held 
a significant importance all of a sudden starts to be less important because you've talked about it. Think about when you've been angry. And then when you talk to your sister, or you talk to, you, you know, that, da, 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 and you yeah. let it out. How do you feel? you feel better? Absolutely. You feel a lot better. You know, Trust. that anxiety lifts. You know? All right. Um, well, Sonia, I really want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Can you please, um, thank you. can you please uh, give us your information? I know you have a skating thing Oh, my God, on. I do. I do. So, um, and also I wanted to say that there's a mental health first aid training that I think everyone should take. Um, you know, I'll put it on. I'll put I'll put a couple of links on your. Is there something where I can post some links? Um, like yes, under uh, under the, the LDM share or something like that. Dot net or the LDM network um web uh Facebook right. You can um you can just send it to Charles Waloma and okay. He'll, I'll share some significant links, but we do have a, a a family skating event that I'm super excited about. It's at Bufano Park, which is on Waterbury, um, between Waterbury and LaSalle, Bradford Avenue in the Bronx. Um, it's from one to four, a hundred free roller rental skates, old school music. And it's just about getting the community involved and Absolutely. action. And, you know, there's hula hoops, face painting. You've yeah, been there, been you know, there she's performed time, there, yeah. you know, um, and again, it's just about starting that con conversation continuing the conversation and building that resiliency toolbox like what does it for you what does it for me let's work together and start building that toolbox that we could reach in for you know um it's Absolutely. from one to four saturday the 18th family skate day and if it's successful then we'll make it a yearly thing and where can our viewers find you um i do have survivor i am on facebook so survivor i am on facebook um my name is sonia cologne you can always friend me I think I have a recognizable picture there. Mm -hmm. um, Survivor I Am does have a website in, in desperate need of someone who's technologically inclined. That'd be nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, come through and, and see us, you know, in action. See, see, see what we do and see what we bring to the community because it's just an awareness and family fun. You, Absolutely. It's fun. Yes, you know, it it's fun. And I want to thank you so much for everything that you're doing for the children, for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you know, keep it up. Um, any other events that you have, you're more than welcome to come back on the show and we speak freely on it. Um, you guys heard it here first. The Thank House you. of Karma, Ms. Sonia Colon, CEO and founder of Survivor I Am. I'm your host, I'm your Karma, and I'll see you next week, same time, same place, LDMNetwork.net. The House of Karma. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>